All right, well, now it's time uh, for our keynote presentation. Now, for those of you here on Monday, you might have heard I've lived here in Austin now for 20 years, and I can tell you for a fact that Mark Papermaster, he's a legend in this town. Um, he held, I was at IBM at the time when I, when I came to Austin, and he was there as well. He held several technical uh, senior leadership positions there. Uh, he was uh, oversaw development of their microprocessor and server development technologies. Then he left IBM, went to Apple, where he became the senior vice president of devices of hardware engineering. He was you know, leading the development of some of those products you might have heard of, like iPhone and iPod. Uh, then he went to Cisco. Uh, and then finally, where at Cisco, he was uh, leading their silicon engineering group, finally came to AMD in 2011. And that's where he currently serves as chief technology officer and senior vice president. He's responsible for their corporate technical direction and for their IP and SOC product research and development. He has more than 30 years of engineering experience, which includes significant leadership roles, managing the development of a wide range of products, from mobile devices to high-performance servers. Now, Mark also uh, got his bachelor's degree here in town at the University of Texas, uh, his uh, double E, and um, University of Vermont for his master's degree. I saw your colleague, Mark McDermott, at one of our uh, parties, DAC parties last night. I was asking, well, what, what can I say about Mark Papermaster? And you're saying, well, one of the things we did is back, uh, I don't know what, when it was, but he said, we started the VLSI program at UT to really become what it is. So many of you engineers here maybe that, that went to UT benefited from really the uh, construction of that program by Mark. So I want to thank you, you know, for helping, helping build this technical community here. And, um, and Mark's going to talk about uh, the challenge to develop truly great products. Not just, you know, he's been leading teams for many different companies. He's seen many different cultures. I think we have a lot we can learn from that. So please welcome Mark Papermaster. Thank you, Chuck. Sure. All right. Well, good morning. Or, you know, how y'all doing? I got to get back in my Texas uh, swing here. Some of you, uh, hopefully, are from Austin. But it really is great to be here at the 53rd Design Automation Conference. It's, it's simply a great venue. I've, I've either been here or had you know, members of my team here over uh, many years. The first DAC I attended was actually uh, uh, the 24th DAC in Miami. And it's just, to me, amazing uh, to just Step back, think of the advances from those early decks. Think of what you all have done as a design community and how you progress technology. And in fact, that's some of the themes I want to hit on today. It, it's not a, a typical keynote. I'm not burrowing down on one aspect of the technology. I decided to you know, really take a few minutes and to back up and look at what makes great products. It is technology, but it's equally how you put teams together, the culture that you put in place to motivate engineers to understand the problem that you're solving and, and design. In fact, uh, the other aspect is where we're at, this juncture that we're at in industry right now. And so I equally well could have titled this conference that there's never been a better time to develop great products. And I feel incredibly passionate about that. I tell you, um, when you think about the possibilities as we transition, you've seen it, you've walked the exhibition halls here, uh, you're seeing what's happening as we enter this immersive area, which, which I will uh, spend a little time with and give you my thoughts on, on what that means. And uh, hopefully we have a little bit of time at the end for Q&A, so I've tried to uh, allow just some dialogue uh, if we can at the end. Let's, uh, let's hope we can do that. All right, uh, jumping in. What uh, I'd like to do is um, if we go to the next slide, I'd like to uh, just tell you a little about, you got the introduction from Chuck, so you know some of my, my history there. Uh, and he also, he let slip that I've been in the industry over 30 years. So uh, I'm sure uh, some of you out there said, wow, uh, you know, he's pretty old. But uh, hopefully, hopefully some of you say, hey, maybe he's seen some things. Uh, maybe he's learned a few things along the way. That's what I'm hoping you'll conclude when we're, when we're done here. But uh, honestly, I decided early on that I love technology. Uh, it's, you know, to me, it's my passion. I like working with smart people. I've been fortunate to work at uh, great companies that have a lot of smart people 
And I love nothing more than getting a group together uh, and really understanding how that group can make a difference, how they can get great products out together. You know, in, for, in, uh, in IBM, where I spent uh, you know, uh, many years of my career, I learned early on that that uh, role was called management. And my, uh, my peers at the time said, Mark, you went over to the dark side. But honestly, uh, technology management, uh, you don't lose your roots in technology. It's, it's, it's simply a different aspect from being an diff, uh, individual contributor. But it is nothing but being steep te technology, understanding it, yet figuring out how you bring smart people together to do things. And it's been a lot of fun. In fact, when you really have a passion for what you're doing, it's really not work. It's fun. It's exciting. It's exhilarating. And in fact, sometimes it's daunting and exhausting. But that's what it is when you have that opportunity to work on what you have a passion for. And I'll tell you, in the end, when you can deliver that product to market, and you see it making a difference, and your team feels that pride, there's, there's actually nothing more rewarding. I mean, that's, as a design community, that's, that's what you all are here. You're at the Design Automation Conference. That's what it's about. And I've been, again, very fortunate. And what I want to do is step back, look a little bit uh, at those uh, 30 years. Uh, if I go to the next slide, you can see uh, I define, you know, really, uh, the, the eras that I'm going to talk about is the start of the PC. And it's right about when I joined the industry. The PC had uh, just come out, and it was called Personal Computer. And it did just that. You know, think about it. I, I'll, I'll remember when I was an intern at the University of Texas, as you mentioned, and I was working on the space shuttle program uh, down in Houston. And we were on mainframes. We were punching cards. And, it, and, I, and, and yet, all the new technology and the user, user interfaces were coming out, and we were all chomping at the bit to enter this new era uh, where we could get much more accessibility to information. I mean, think about what it used to be when you needed to do research. You were, doing, you were going to the libraries. You were hiring you know, people to help you get all this information. The rise of the PC and easy access to the internet changed everything. It, it truly was uh, the start of this new era. And you know, it, was, it was exhilarating. Oh, by the way, it enabled collaboration. Unfortunately, it also uh, enabled that barrage of email uh, that you get every day, too. But uh, truly, it was, it was a, a liberating experience. And it, it sped what all of us, as design community, uh, were able to accomplish. And it was fueled by Moore's Law. I have to admit, I took it for granted. Of course you'll get a doubling of the number of transistors or the performance every 18 to 24 months. We were entitled to that. That's what I grew up in. Uh, you know, that was, you know, that's, was. And, and occasionally, you know, again, I'll, I'll date myself. I remember people would foretell that the end was already here. Uh, I remember industry-wide submicron task force. How could we break this barrier? And of course, at every one of these junctures, innovation ruled the day. Uh, and Moore's Law has continued uh, for a period of time. And it fueled during this, not just PCs, but this whole transition to what I call the smartphone er era. Why? Because as you were getting that efficiency and you're able to get more and more computing in the same cost and the same power envelope, you could also start shifting that design uh, to be quite capable and much lower power. And that led to the mobile revolution. And when the mobile devices got married and integrated with other functionality, it became a smartphone and the whole app system, making it easier uh, to run applications. Meteoric growth. It was a new industry, and, and no one, you know, we had not seen anything like it operate at that rate and pace. And I'll talk about that, but uh, you know, I just want to sort of plant that seed of think about it. There were some factors that came together that allowed this meteoric growth. And I think we all learned about what some of those factors are. And uh, you know, we'll talk about that uh, in just a moment. So, uh, so we've talked about this personal computing era. We talked about smartphones where personal computing basically could go with you everywhere. It was in your pocket. Uh, you know, it, it, now it's on your watch. It's, you know, it's, uh, it's getting to be uh, really uh, you know, embedded in our day-to-day -day lives. And so Moore's Law was great. It was a phenomenal ride, but uh, 
it's slowing. We all know this. Uh, we've been living this uh, for the last few years, and it's not dead. Uh, everyone agrees it's not dead, but the pace is slowing. I, we don't have that entitlement by any means that we used to have of, of you know, doing innovative things and knowing that that technology would allow us at that same cost and, and improvement in power uh, be able to move our ideas forward. And so when you look at, uh, it, when you look at what this means, uh, it, it says that every semiconductor node now, it's going to take a little longer. It's also going to be a little bit more expensive. It's going to take a little longer to make. And so it's going to change the way we think about and apply design. You can't ignore this trend. None of us are, right? You're, you're all are in the midst of it. You're living this, and it's driving your innovation. And what I think you're seeing is it's driving a couple different approaches where you need full mobility. It's a wearable device. It's, you know, it's in your pocket. It's got to be you know, as miniaturized as possible. You'll continue to see uh, that monolithic integration and driving down that, uh, you know, that functionality in a minimum, minimum power. Now, that'll need a high volume economy of scale to afford that. But for applications that need high performance, you're going to actually see a lot of innovation about how you put those solutions together, how you design. Because that's the only way uh, that the performance, that high performance, is going to keep on that exponential Moore's Law pace. And that's happening. And that is what's helping fuel what we call the third wave. So you had that PC era, you had the smartphone uh, and, and app era. And if we go to the next slide, uh, you know, I'll describe to you uh, what, what I call uh, the immersive era. So uh, it's not that Moore's Law is going away. It's slowing. And I call Moore's Law Plus this new era of absolutely relying on semiconductor technology advances, but adding it to innovative design approaches and integrating technologies together. And so it's going to take creativity. It's going to take a combination of advanced CPUs for computation. GPUs for both computation and visualization, accelerators. It's going to take system design of really optimally putting that together and driving high performance at the same pace that we've been living before or faster, right? Uh, it's going to take this type of approach. And the time is right. Several factors have come together. When you look at it, uh, that smartphone era drove the connectivity, right? So the, the ability to connect devices. Is, is well known. Um, you know, the, the advances of standards, you know, 802.11 AC today, AD is going to be a phenomenal advancement. So you're going to be able to get that pervasive connectivity at higher and higher bandwidth, right? More and more information flow. Voice and image recognition on the backs of the improvements of machine learning have advanced to phenomenally high accuracy. It's just incredible. I, I, I took my entire photo album on uh, Google Photos the other day and just you know, identified everybody. You know, it, just, it's, it just immediately was indexed. It, it, you know, it was just phenomenal. The accuracy blew me away. And you're seeing that with the new products, with Echo and, and Siri and a whole raft of new products coming out that have phenomenal voice recognition accuracy. So that's really a second a trend that's coming together. Third. Graphics rendering and ultra high resolution displays are phenomenally advanced, right? And, and uh, we've got uh, great ideas on how to keep that going at a very high performance rate. And then lastly, it's a software. It's ecosystem and, and, and uh, development. And uh, there's been a, a broader and broader adoption of open source and a broader community to drive forward that software enablement. So you've really got a number of factors that have come together that are going to enable this Moore's Law Plus and are going to fuel this immersive era. And you know, it's, it's hard to underestimate the impact this is going to have. Uh, you, know, you look at um, World Economic Forum. Uh, Klaus Schwab, uh, founder of the World Economic Forum, uh, gave an address uh, this January, actually, just a few months ago. And he said that we stand on the brink of a technological revolution. The speed of current breakthroughs has no historical precedent. No historical precedent. And you know, he, he, there's actually, you should check it out. I, the, watch the YouTube. 
and look at some of the examples that are out there, and it's amazing the impact this can have on our society. Right? So this is, that's not a design automation conference. World Economic Forum is recognizing that this inflection point that we're coming in uh, is upon us. I couldn't agree more. And I see these applications coming out fueled by the advances in compute and visualization. And you're starting to see that it's fundamentally changing the way that we interface with computing. Right? So you know, it's, we had the GUI, we had the mouse, the point and click, uh, we had touch, we had the mobile revolution. Immersive computing is that next inflection point. It is that, that next fundamental change of how computing can impact all of us in our daily lives. It, it truly is becoming seamless. It truly is being woven in the fabric of our lives. It's almost becoming literally, uh, it being taken literally, and it'll, you'll see it soon, woven in the fabric of clothes that we wear. You're gonna see it shrunk down to where it's literally in contact lenses that, that we put on over our eyes. So the, the world really is poised for an onslaught of great products. So you look at this and you say, my God, absolutely, we should have so many great products, this is gonna be amazing. But that's where I'm gonna shift gears a little bit. What does it take to get a great product out? You know, I, I go to a consumer electronics show every year, every January, and I walk the floors, and you can see, you can see the start of products to enable this immersive era start to come out, and you see dozens of them. And you know, as I walk across that floor, it's pretty clear to me that most of them actually won't reach commercial success. It's, it's a fact, right? We know that uh, as you look at just product history uh, because what it turns out is while we have year after year this phenomenal technological change, what it takes to actually get out a great product, those are kind of principles that repeat time and time again. So again, I'm gonna change gears just a little bit. I'll come back to Immersive Era, but I'm gonna change gears a little, a little bit because I feel equally passionate about how you build the product what you build and how you build the product as I do about the technology that fuels it. You can't separate the two. They're equally indelibly tied. And if you forget that, you will be one of those raft of products that fail because you lost sight of that fundamental tenets of what it takes to build a great, build a great product. Again, uh, hopefully your head will nod and you'll say, you know, I, I got it, Mark, uh, you, know, that's, I'm, you know, I'm doing that. But I, I'd ask you just to, to think a little bit as we go through the next few minutes, think about what it takes to put all of this together, not just any one vector piece we talk, but about really putting it together. And it starts with, on a great product, uh, defining what problem are you solving, right? Th this is the why, right? Why am I doing this? And you, you've got to actually spend a little time on it, right? And it's once you define that and you understand how the product is gonna be impactful, you need to articulate it, you need to make it visible. The, the, the team that you're building have to buy in, they have to, uh, they have to really internalize the why of the product. And once you do that, it leads to the rest because then uh, you're gonna find that you know, clearly you're gonna need some innovations. You may have had an idea of a couple of what you felt were breakthrough innovations, but once you fleshed out that why, it's problem solving that drives innovation. People don't go off in a room and say, let's go solve a problem and let's think of it. it you, you typically, uh, you're on a path, you're trying to do something, you've got the why internalized and that's what drives innovation. That's what drives the creative juices. Uh, I've seen it time and time again and it's incredibly, uh, exciting process. And then of course, the innovations on their own, they're necessary, but those innovations are on their own, as I said, insufficient, uh, because you've really got to bring it all together. Uh, you've got to keep that why in front of you, and you've got to figure out how you integrate that solution to truly deliver a better experience. And so I, I don't know a better way uh, than uh, you know, to walk through a couple examples uh, in terms of, it, it, you know, just going a little bit deeper into my thoughts around a great product. So uh, let's start with uh, what I just said. In all cases that we're going to go through, I'll go about two or three examples here, and in every one of them, I think you're going to see uh, that it solves a problem, 
Uh, it creates a, a value prop. It, it provides that experience. And, and uh, probably no surprise where I'm going to start. Yeah, it is the iPod and the iPhone. Uh, because I think it is a perfect example of not any one technology being, you know, this, uh, you know, this uh, eureka moment that just enabled. It was, it was an integration. It was how do we create a different experience? What's the why? What's, what is it that's going to really let people do things differently? And that drove the design. Started with the iPod. Simple premise. What if you could have 40 hours of music in your pocket? Oh, and by the way, what if you put a great interface where it was really easy, kind of fun, uh, to pick your music and categorize it? Simple premise, but it, 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 that goal, that, you know, that clarity of value proposition is, is driven years of product advan advancements and, and different models around that theme. And it led into the iPhone, where you know, combined not only that kind of capability, but the mobile phone capabilities, the, you know, the, at least the consumption, content consumption applications that you could do on your personal computer uh, in terms of email and browsing the web and, and what became apps, making it easier to get at those uh, consumption and uh, applications. Look, pr before you know it, this value proposition, this why, became indispensable, right? I, I, I probably, 99% of you have your smartphone with you now, and if you forgot it, you'd practically be feeling naked. Like, what do I do? I don't have my smartphone. You know, that, that's a, a you know, phenomenal definition of, of the application of those principles I talked about. You know, next, I'll talk about uh, game consoles. Uh, people had predicted uh, game consoles would go into decline with the current generation. Why? Who needs it? Uh, you know, it's on your game. You got your tablet or your smartphone, play the game there. Sure, but experience matters, right? We talked about that. And, and what the, the game consoles did was a phenomenal job of changing the whole experience, getting a, a, a graphics and a, and, a, and a game title optimization capability. You know, gamers have an insatiable appetite. And when you can feed that, they're going to want that latest technology. And in fact, uh, as of Q1 of this year, there's over 50 million across Xbox One and, and uh, uh, PlayStation 4. Uh, it's a phenomenal growth of that industry, right? So uh, by no means was it dead. Why? It was driven by great product definitions, bringing new experiences, progressing it forward, and growing the industry. And then back to what I said a moment ago, this enablement uh, of this immersive era, what different thinking around these head mount displays. Uh, it was CES a couple years ago. I was on a panel session with Palmer Lucky, and this was probably when no one had heard of Oculus Rift. And I met him, and I was talking to him, and I, I, I understood his why, his vision of what he was trying to do, and I was blown away. I said, this, this is, this is going to change everything. I arranged to, to go down and meet him down in uh, Southern California and, and meet with him and experience this. And, and frankly, it, it affected us at AMD dramatically. Uh, because we had already been on a pace, we already saw this coming, but we realized that that kind of great product definition, that kind of innovation, oh, and you know, it's followed by you know, HTC Vive, you see uh, uh, Sony's announced, uh, you know, Samsung's announced, number, number of products coming out that are going to enable uh, this new type of experience of virtual reality. In fact, it's projected that by 2020, there'll be over 200 million of these head mount displays sold. So it's, it's enabling a whole new category. Th that's several examples I have of that you know, just gets you thinking about it, it's not ever just one thing. Uh, it's about really understanding how that product makes a difference, how do you enable that experience, and guess what? To actually make any of that happen, you're going to have to bring a team together. You're going to have to start thinking about the, the immediate next uh, after that definition of what's a great product, it's the how. You've done the what and the why. The how is also where I'll, I'll tell you many, many uh, get derailed. And so if I go to the, uh, to the next slide, uh, we're going we're gonna to go through that in a little bit detail. I'm going to describe to you uh, a little bit about where I've seen where folks have not invested the equal energy in the how that they did in, 
in that what, in that early definition phase. And it, it's not that hard. I, I, I look at three elements. Are you super clear on the goals? And did you take the time to rigorously plan what you're doing? Did you build the right team and culture? Because building the right team and culture, it comes from leadership, right? That you can't, you, if, if you have any team leadership role, it's on you uh, to build the right culture. And don't ever underestimate uh, the impact of culture. And then what I call maniacal execution. I'm sorry, it's never easy to get a product out. And if you've particularly, you've, you've leaned in, you've got a challenging product, you've got a product that you think is gonna make a difference, you better figure out how you put in place what I call a maniacal execution mode, because that's the only way you're gonna get it to market. So let's, uh, let's spend a minute. Uh, let's go through. So yes, of course, the graphic is the, seeing the proverbial uh, forest from the trees. But you know, I love it, and I love the quote that I show. Uh, a goal without a plan is just a wish. Antoine Saint-Exupéry, one of my uh, favorite books, is uh, The Little Prince, Le Petit Prince. Phenomenal. If you, you look at those insights, and, and spot on, spot on in terms of, uh, of, of planning. Because once you have the full understanding of the product and what you want to do, you then have to really hammer out uh, those goals. Uh, you have to put enough rigor in. You have to define the specifications uh, that you know that as you execute, you didn't lose sight, that you didn't vector off, and that you can actually implement uh, what you had set out to do. And you know, equally important with defining those goals, what you're, you know, uh, how you're going to implement, and exactly what are those specifications, is what you're not doing. Uh, scope creep is the bane of the existence in what all of us do here in the, the design community. You've lived it, um, you nod your head, absolutely, but that's part of the planning process. You've gotta put the bands, you've gotta stay focused and put the bounds of what you're trying to do, put that plan in place, decide what you're not doing, and ensure that there's a simplicity that's embraced by the whole team. I, I attack it very simply. Any project I'm involved in, any product, I ask that we write the press release of what we're doing now. I mean, what is it? What was that why? Let's write the press release now. Let's understand that value proposition. Let's keep it simple. It should be an elevator speech. Little, you know, it, it seems uh, like a little thing, but it's actually incredibly effective at helping keep that clarity of focus. And then lastly, I talk about, uh, click here, I talk about high-level design. Uh, at AMD, we're, we're a bit religious on this because uh, what we found is that if you don't invest that time, and what I call high-level design is that detailed assessment and feasibilities that you do before you put the masses on a product uh, to go drive its detailed implementation. And the kind of chip designs we do, it is masses of people. And so that high-level design is fundamental to test your assumptions, uh, to really make sure uh, that, that they hold water, right? that you've done enough work up front, uh, that you don't have fundamental false, false principles uh, that you've uh, banked your product on, that you bring in the best practices, and frankly, that you bring in a fresh set of eyes. Uh, if you're a startup, this is a little bit hard, but hopefully you have a board of advisors. But for big companies, you want to bring in experts that are on other projects. Fresh pair of eyes, a deep expertise uh, that can provide you know, very critical thinking feedback as to where you may have been blinded by uh, you know, your passion for the product and missed a few things. So again, uh, you, know, you can look at all this and you say, I got it, that makes common sense. Sure, this should all make common sense. The trick is not getting lost in the details, seeing the forest and the trees, and staying focused in terms of your uh, product design and execution. I'm gonna go through uh, culture a little bit uh, because as I said, I often see uh, that, uh, you know, that teams, uh, a number of teams don't, don't, don't really spend the time here. They give it a little bit of lip service in terms of the impact of culture. And I, I think uh, culture matters. I think it's quite fundamental. Uh, I've seen uh, poor culture derail many a product I've seen poor culture derail many a company. And so when I talk about uh, the culture, uh, at first it starts with leadership. Uh, the leadership you know, has to have a balance 
of technical depth, right? We're all in technology here. Uh, it's about having a technical depth uh, to understand the subject matter. It's about being able to listen, to listen to the team, to listen to customers, to feel the pulse of the industry, uh, to be able to connect. And lastly, uh, it's really about that ability to lead, to inspire people and to share that why of the products and get people fired up about it, make sure that they're fully bought in. And so culture does matter. And, and frankly, what I found is there's really four tenets that I think are, are fundamental. And uh, uh, anyone watching from uh, one of my, my teams will say, okay, Mark, we've heard this 100 times. I do preach it because that's, that's what I feel. And it starts with transparency. Um, I don't have any other way than straight talk. I, I, you know, I've been doing this for many, many years, and uh, it served me well. Uh, whatever it is, you've got to call it. And you need that pervasive across your entire team, uh, your entire company. Uh, it, you know, and if you have transparency, by the way, uh, you're going to understand and be able to communicate on the issues that they come up. And so transparency leads to identification of the issues, uh, you know, being able to really manage well because everything's on the table. There's nothing swept under the rug. Problems hidden, problems not communicated. I'm sorry, they don't ever go away. They just fester and get worse. So transparency has to lead uh, to a culture of, you know, issue resolution and, you know, solving those problems and making decisions. What are we doing, right? Uh, you know, everyone has a way of doing this. You know, I uh, can tell you uh, the phrases I've used, you know, one hat on the horse, who's that owner? At Apple, it's called the DRI, the directly responsible individual. Fundamental, transparency, get in on the table, what are the issues, go into problem solving mode and have clear decision making. And then of course, risk taking. Risk taking has to be very visible. What are your risks? You have to have a culture of risk taking. If you don't, you're not gonna get a great product out. I haven't seen one yet that doesn't have elements of risk. Uh, every, every one of the examples uh, that I showed you had huge risk. Uh, you, you look at those iPods and iPhones and the amount of new technology that was being integrated. Look at the camera function uh, with uh, the, the plastic lens and the ability to have integrated in what had been an entirely separate device into an incredibly small form factor. Uh, look at what uh, the kind of graphics rendering capability that the, that the game consoles pioneered. And of course, we talked about uh, HM, HMDs, head mount displays, and I'll talk more about that later. All of them entail significant risk, uh, and it's got to be on the table. Uh, you've, got, you've got to be able to really uh, manage it very effectively. And then what I'd, have, what I'd say is that, uh, you know, the recipe for success for the team uh, you know, is, is really that if you do all of this, you build trust. And it doesn't get better than that. Once you, once you have a team that you've developed this culture and you trust each other, I'm hard pressed to see that you're gonna run into a problem that that, that team won't rise to and solve and get great products to market. Okay, so what I'd like to uh, talk then is just the team aspects. So broad system thinkers, deep and narrow experts. Why do I highlight that at the start is those are two opposites into the spectrum, right? But you need diversity on a team. You do not want homogeneous thinking. You don't want group think uh, if you're gonna push the edges and any boundaries as you're developing. So you've really gotta get, uh, you know, very much a diverse set of thinking. You're gonna have, uh, you know, the devil's advocate versus the dreamer. You need, you need the pragmatist to round out the team. And you know, oftentimes I look at it, and as I build teams, I've often heard feedback, oh, you don't want this person, you don't want Joe, you don't want Sally, don't get them on the team. Why? They're a naysayer. You know, we, we, we want only the visionaries to be on this team as we're coming up with the, you know, going through that how and what and uh, uh, planning of new products. But I'll tell you, rounding out the team is fundamental because you have to get the diversity of thinking uh, be, uh, and you have to have debate. Debate's a great thing. Uh, you know, anyone that's, uh, uh, if you sat in on any one of my team meetings, you'd probably be a bit shocked. It's kind of raucous at times. People are throwing uh, spears, it's all professional, but people are throwing spears at each other. There's good and healthy debate, uh, you know. 
Uh, we have escalations. Escalations, I, I use the phrase, escalation's not a bad word. You know, something's not getting done. Put it out there. You know, create, create contention. Healthy contention. Professional contention. But you've got to build the right culture that allows you to build a diverse team that can work together in healthy contention and push the edges of a design to get a product out. Again, uh, it, it sounds straightforward, but you know, if you do that right, then you get back to you've addressed the cultural aspect, you've addressed team, and it, then it comes down to execution. And when you do the first two right, guess what? Execution happens because you put that right leadership. You've got that culture of transparency where issues as they come up get on the table. They don't get buried and come back and bite you later, which I've seen many products uh, be delayed with the late surfacing of a problem. It's too late. If it just would have been identified early, you could have jumped on it, got a team on it, uh, resolved the issue. So maniacal execution is key, and I want to give you, you know, a couple thoughts I have around it. And that is, uh, first, metrics. Uh, I spend a lot of time with metrics. Uh, metrics telegraph what you think is important. I go through dashboards, and, and I actually spend a lot of time up front of making sure that the measurements really protect that why of the product. If we hit those metrics, will we have what we set out to go do? Right behind that, risk milestone and management. Hey, everybody does it. Of course, I've got my milestones on the development process. But how many times has it been a check in the box? Yep, of course, you know, everyone expected us to hit milestone X in the state. Check, we hit it. Oh, by the way, there's 50 exceptions that we had, and we kind of blew by that. Well, that's a recipe for, uh, for a miss. Uh, you know, milestones are there for a reason. You've got you've to manage the risk. You try to drive early identification and corrective action. And lastly, I can't uh, speak strong enough, own your dependencies. Who, if, if you made a decision as a product owner to contract or bring in a third party, that's fine. But it won't do you any service later to tell your constituents that, hey, we did fine, but this dependency fell short. It doesn't work like that. If you're driving great products to market, you better own your dependencies. And that means bringing them as a part of your team. Whatever metrics, whatever risk milestones you have, you better have all your dependencies going through that same process. Uh, they're a part of your team. Often overlooked, fundamental in terms of being able uh, to get products out. And you know, I love uh, the quote by Thomas Edison. You know what? Here he is, one of the most prolific inventors in the, in the history of the world, and his quote is, vision without executions, a hallucination. He gets it. He got it. It's obvious. Okay, so I'm going to shift gears a little bit. I told you I was going to come back uh, to this topic of uh, immersive reality. So let's spend a little uh, bit of time there. We talked about these head mount displays. They're enabling a whole different experience. And 2016 is the year. This is where you'll start to see if you looked at my curve, it's still a slow ramp, uh, of course, as the adoption of any new technology takes off. But Bloomberg recently put an estimate uh, that, frankly, that this market would get to 80 billion by 2025. Now, who knows if that's an accurate number with these early projections, but uh, I certainly agree that the advent and the slope of this technology will move quickly. And I want to uh, just tell you why I feel that. It's, when you look at uh, what I talked about, that slope of uh, the smartphone industry, people understand the factors of enablement. You needed the new technology, we're getting that. Great CPU, great graphics, head mount displays, you know, the, we're getting the right software enablement. It, it takes, uh, you know, the, the uh, just like games are developed with game engines, you're seeing software packages to really spur the development of virtual reality and augmented reality experiences. And so you're starting to see very quickly a software and hardware ecosystem. Again, it's not just, it's necessary but not sufficient to have one point innovation. It's about building out a system design, building out an ecosystem, and that is coming together uh, to really uh, create, a, you know, this immersive era, a reality. And so uh, when you think about everything that can be transformed here, it's pretty amazing. We, we've been spending time here. This is uh, near and dear to us at, at AMD. 
And so, you know, I'll give you a couple of thoughts. Uh, don't, none of us should be surprised. You know, it starts with uh, entertainment and gaming as early adopters. And, and you've seen it. Great, uh, you know, great um, uh, products are just starting to come out. Uh, you know, of course, it's early. It's like, think about those first uh, smartphones. There's aspects of it that you might say, well, it's a little clunky. I'm, you know, that HMD for a true uh, high-end immersive experience, you know, it's got to be tethered to a PC. Sure, but watch this space. Again, think about those early smartphones and how quickly the form factors evolved and the ease of use evolved. So, you know, you're seeing that right now in, in uh, entertainment gaming, but it doesn't stop there by any means. Training and simulation. Uh, there was an article actually just in April where uh, the Royal London Hospital had a program to, dis to educate their medical students. And they did an entire surgery, a tumor removal, uh, with 360 de degree capture and created a training of performing that entire surgery and, and, and allowing it to train their medical students in a virtual reality environment going forward. You, you look at... Um, Met the actual practice of medicine itself, uh, we're getting great adva advances in, in, in starting to come out uh, leveraging this technology. One of the most uh, impressive to me is post-traumatic stress disorder treatment, where uh, soldiers may have gone through uh, uh, you know, a very traumatic experience, others in their life experience a, a, a very traumatic situation, and frankly, the only way uh, to bring them out of that is through therapy, where you carefully recreate and, and stage as you take them through that experience. And VR has uh, shown actually quite significant impact in treating that disorder. So it's very, very exciting. And you look at uh, what's coming around the corner in terms of uh, you know, education. We worked with, uh, at AMD, we worked with Smithsonian Institute. And you look at you know, 120, 112 years ago, uh, there was the Orville uh, Wilbur and uh, Orville Wright had the first powered flight. And Smithsonian recreated that in a virtual reality. And so you're actually, students can start to not just read about history, but, but be there in a virtual environment, relive the experience. And of course, on with you know, big data visualization. Think about Iron Man and, you know, and, and, and the way you know, he was designing in, in a virtual environment, an augmented reality environment. The future is very exciting, and the applications are starting now, and there'll be a very rapid advancement of these applications. And I look at how it gets spurred, and I really view it as uh, two sides of the brain, the left brain, right brain. Um, it's an easy way for me to think about it, and that is first, you know, the, the compute side. You know, you have to have a massive amount of compute to create this, uh, you know, this type of capability. You have to have artificial intelligence to bring this in. And then you have to, on the visualization side, the right side of the brain, we're driving to photorealism. This is where we've been focused at AMD. So I'm gonna spend the last couple minutes uh, just letting you know how have we applied that whole concept of coming up with how you run a team and, and what is it you're trying to build and how can you make a difference? We are focused on making immersive era a reality at AMD, and we think about it on how do we play to our strengths. Our strengths are compute and graphics, and this is where we're going we're gonna to drive uh, with some exciting new products. I'll start with what we showed and demoed uh, last week at Computex in Taipei. Totally new CPU core. AMD has a deep heritage of CPU design, had a, had a fantastic team. It's that same team that just closed the gap to get us back to high performance with this new Zen core that was demonstrated last week. So it'll be sampling this year. Uh, it's out there in our labs, it's coming up. It's a great job doing the design team. How did they close the gap versus our big competitor on performance? It was those attributes about setting the right goal, getting the team together, keeping the team focused, and they've done a beautiful job. Very excited with the new CPU and, in, and the impact it will have empowering and removing bottlenecks uh, with the new immersive era. Let me shift uh, then to talk about graphics. Uh, obviously, uh, you know, this is a you know, strong suit of AMD. It back, dates back to the acquisition of ATI uh, back in uh, mid-2000s. And so we're incredibly focused and have a suite of products out that are VR ready, that can give you a true sense of presence, not a, not, not a cardboard box with a smartphone, but truly a presence where you have a, you know, a, an immersive experience. 
And we're very excited also at Computex last week uh, to have announced the RX 480. It's a FinFET-based design, just like the new Zen cores in FinFET. I love the award uh, for the artwork on uh, the FinFET. It's a, it is a beautiful technology uh, because it, it really is marrying very well with our designs on CPU and graphics and allowed us to drastically, with design and semiconductor, drive a 2.8x in terms of performance per watt, the efficiency of this design. So really breakthrough, and, it's gonna, it's, and we're going to aggressively push it out there to enable sub $1,000 PCs and grow the development of this VR industry. We're also committed to open source, so we put all of our device stack out on gpuopen.com for both compute, uh, with our uh, Radeon Open Compute, across our driver stack, uh, across uh, OpenVX for uh, you know, machine vision, et cetera. So check out gpuopen.com if you haven't already. And then, of course, the future's bright. Your jobs are all safe, I can guarantee you. The demand for technology in this new era is just going to be huge. So you look at those head mount displays today, it's roughly 2K resolution of the display you have. Uh, you need a very quick latency. The brain runs at about three milliseconds. You need to be less than 10 and about eight teraflops. But where this is going to have full presence, to have you know, just you know, photorealism type of imagery and, and, and a full presence is about 80X, 80X. So lots of room for innovation as we go forward. And that leads to the comment I had at the beginning. There is, there has never been a better time for innovation. Uh, you look at, at what we need ahead of us, uh, it's, it's phenomenal in terms of the opportunities that we have and the opportunities that each of you can drive from a design standpoint. And so what I'd ask you to think about as I close, as I see uh, uh, that we're almost out of time here, is have you embraced the challenge? Are you looking at this inflection point with the industry that you're in and saying, how can I make a difference? How can we make a difference with our team? Because I'll tell you, you will regret if you let this opportunity pass you by. Very rare. Again, I've been at this a number of years. Very rare do you see this kind of inflection point. It's starting right now in 2016 with the new enablement products. You should think of this as absolutely akin to the start of the smartphone era, but frankly, that the application space will be much broader. So it is a huge opportunity, and I challenge you to pick out where you can make a difference and where you can bring great products to market and let's usher in this new era of immersive. Thanks very much. Thank you, Mark. That was terrific. Appreciate it. So on behalf of myself and the DAC Executive Committee, I'd like to give you this plaque to help you remember this day in this keynote. Great, thank, thank you. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you all. all right. If you have, I know we ran out of time for uh, Q&A. Okay, but uh, do you have time after for people to I come do. Up? All right, so if anyone has any questions, please come on up and um, we'll, we'll take them offline. Thank you very much. Right. Great.